Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. As a professor of astrophysics, you might be shocked to learn I don't believe in the law of gravity. I don't believe in black holes. I don't even believe the sun rises in the east. I don't have to believe in these things because I have evidence for them. For centuries, scientists have used evidence to test their ideas of the physical world. It's called the scientific method, and it's the most powerful knowledge generation tool ever invented. In contrast, it's common to use words like belief or faith when discussing God. Although the universe seems tuned for our existence, even the faithful admit there's no cold, hard evidence that such a tuner exists. They take it on faith. Because of the lack of cold, hard data, it's probably not surprising that over 70% of the National Academy of Sciences, the most prestigious association of scientists in the United States, do not believe in God. So how do these secular scientists account for our existence without a creator? Many cosmologists explain the fine-tuning of our universe described in this video on the fine-tuning of inflationary cosmology lies in a new theory called the multiverse. According to these scientists, what we used to call the universe is not the whole enchilada, not by a long shot. In the multiverse theory, our universe is accompanied by not just one, two, three other universes, but perhaps by an infinite number of them. Some would be too hot for life, some would be too cold for a life like ours to develop, but with an infinite number of them, like Goldilocks, some would be just right. To supporters of the multiverse paradigm, our existence is an accident that was bound to happen in such a capacious cosmos. What's surprising, though, is that even scientists who believe in the multiverse admit there's no hard data supporting it. How is a scientist supposed to evaluate an idea for which there is no evidence? In 1959, Karl Popper devised a way to test if an idea was truly scientific or if it was pseudoscientific mumbo-jumbo cloaked in technical dressing. At that time, he was very much concerned with astrology, phrenology, and the new interpretation of dreams popularized by Sigmund Freud and others. He said, if there's no way to disprove a claim, if it can't be falsified, it's not science. Originally, his bet noir was astrology, whose practitioners divine the fate of individuals from the positions of celestial bodies in the day of their birth. Popper said that astrologers' predictions were so nebulous that nothing could falsify them. Here's a typical horoscope for me, a Virgo. Today will bring unexpected challenges. Such a prediction is so imprecise it's bound to be accurate, not only for my sign, but for the 11 other ones as well. Popper said it is typical of astrologers' tricks to predict things so vaguely that the predictions can hardly be failed. Those among us who are unwilling to expose their ideas to the hazard of refutation do not get to take part in the scientific game. Sadly for Popper, nowadays Sutton newspapers devote more of their ink to astrology than they do to astronomy. The reason is simple. People are naturally biased to believe vague but accurate explanations of their fates, especially when it comes from authority. Despite stereotypes of the contrary, we scientists are people too. We sometimes want to believe things that comport with our own theories and discard discordant data, a phenomenon known as confirmation bias. Scientists also represent society's most revered authorities. Unfortunately, the combination of authority bias and confirmation bias is leading to some pretty unscientific effects, especially when it comes to the biggest theory of them all, quite literally, the multiverse. Take Nobel laureate Steven Weinberg. To Weinberg, the multiverse's infinite vastness is a good piece of news. It offers a reason why, quote, we find ourselves in a universe favorable to life that does not rely on the benevolence of a creator, and so, if correct, will leave still less support for religion. It sounds to me like he's arguing on behalf of the atheist position. But this could be bad news when it comes to the scientific method. For as physicist Paul Davies of Arizona State University has said, invoking an infinity of unseen universes to explain the unusual features of the one we do see is just as ad hoc as invoking an unseen creator. The multiverse theory may be dressed up in scientific language, but in essence, it requires the same leap of faith. Now, Davies is a noted cosmologist who has made contributions, including things like the Bunch Davies vacuum and other things that we'll explore in this channel. And Weinberg is noted for his famous quip when posing the question of whether or not he would bet his life or his dog's life 
on the existence of the multiverse quip that he would bet Martin Reese's dog's life and Andre Linde's life on the existence of the multiverse. And it's notable to me that people like Linde will say things to the effect that they would bet their life and we should not have more bias towards the existence of a universe, namely one universe, over the existence of multiple universes, to quote Linde in his own words. Since any data, or even the absence of data, could be considered consistent with the multiverse, this model of cosmogenesis could be immune to falsification. Because of this, some of the detractors of the multiverse call it a theory of anything, reminding me of G.K. Chesterton's quip, reportedly, when men stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing, they believe in anything. In the case of the multiverse, Chesterton's wisecrack is literally true. The same scientists who reject God's existence, due to insufficient evidence, have placed their faith in a theory which seemingly neglects the scientific method. To be fair, there are other proposals out there that can test the multiverse hypothesis, and some say it's just a matter of time before evidence is found. But be wary when a cosmologist tells you to be patient. It could take a billion years or so until we know the answer. Until then, cosmologists must keep the faith. I'll put here some links to papers where people do attempt to make predictions as to what we'd see if the multiverse did have universes like our own, or maybe even unlike our own, that we could come into causal contact with and perhaps see the imprint of, perhaps through so-called circles in the sky and the cosmic microwave background scenarios. We'll explore those in future videos. Now, as cosmologists struggle to explain the universe we do see, to explain the very existence of time, space, energy, and even life, scientists should take a candid accounting of our motivations. Why do we support the theories that we do support? If we do so with honesty, we can remain in Popper's scientific game. Otherwise, we might just be taking a huge leap of faith. If you enjoyed this video, you definitely want to check out this playlist with my cosmology friends talking about the origin and evolution of the universe. And if you're interested in a deep dive in the multiverse, wormholes, and other exotic phenomena, click here and hear my conversation with Juan Maldesena of the Institute for Advanced Study. Enjoy, and don't forget to subscribe for more amazing content.